Okay, this is lecture diabetes number six. We're gonna be talking about South Asians, persons from India especially, and with regard to dietary effects and their incidence, high incidence of diabetes. Southeast, South Asian, it's not Southeast, South Asian Indian persons have seven times more diabetes. That's a lot, and no one would have expected that. If you asked me in my mind, what's the stereotype? I think of an Indian guy. I think of a male, skinny doctor, healthy, uh, that's what my immediate thought comes to my mind. Most of the Indian guys I know, they're all doctors. Um, so when I heard that they have seven times increased incidence of diabetes compared to American Caucasians, I was quite surprised by that statistic. Um, okay, so we're going to be talking about the effect on the electron transport chain, but we'll come to that in a little bit. I'll go over what that means. HNE is hydroxynonanol. That's a major player in all this. Okay, um, <clears throat> so South Asia means like India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Um, East Asia is like China, Japan, Korea. And then Southeast Asia is like Vietnam, Cambodia, Philippines. Okay, South Asian persons from India and that area up above have seven times more incidence of diabetes. They also have increased coronary artery disease. Um, they tend to present with coronary artery disease-related symptoms or myocardial infarction at about 10 years younger than, you know, other Americans. Okay, they've got less obesity. They tend to be skinny. Most Indian persons I know are skinny. You think of them as being vegetarians. Um, they have relatively less hypertension, relatively less tobacco. I never know a single Indian guy that smokes. Okay, so why do they have so much diabetes? Well, here's my theory. I think it's because they eat a lot of fried food. Lots of Indian foods, fried food. You've been to an Indian restaurant, a lot of fried food. And they also eat dairy. Surprisingly, a lot of dairy. So I think it was being vegetarian, but they're really lacto-vegetarians that eat oil. And I think especially the frying food is what gives them such a high rate of diabetes is my best guess, based on having studied this for a while. Um, Pre-diabetes means that you've got insulin resistance due to high-fat diet, but... Um, the beta cells are still working. Once full-blown diabetes is diagnosed, diabetes type 2, we're all talking about diabetes type 2, adult diabetes here, um, that means there's some beta cell dysfunction. Usually about 50% of the beta cells are non-functional at the time of diagnosis. And they lose about 5 more percent of those uh, beta cells every year. And that's why you got to turn around diabetes pretty fast. You're diagnosed with diabetes, you want to turn it around within four years. This is virtually almost 100% full reversal of diabetes type 2 if you if you go low-fat vegan within four years. And some people still are able to turn it around after many, many years, but their odds aren't as good the more time goes by. Progressively becomes more difficult to reverse. Okay, here is the structure of hydroxynonanol. So it's called, HNE is hydroxynonanol. Sometimes you see a 4-hydroxynonanol. So the 4 is because it's on carbon 4. So here's carbon number 1 with an aldehyde group. Aldehyde group means a double bond to the oxygen, also called a carbonyl group. And then just a hydrogen. That's what's coming off of that carbon. Then here's carbon number 2. And so the double bond's called ene, E-N-E. And you'll, e -N -E, and you'll often see, you'll sometimes see a number 2 in the name. So that's why you'll sometimes see it called 4 hydroxy 2 nonanol or non 2 enol Okay, that just means the double bonds on the second carbon. And then here's carbon number three, and here's carbon number four. The hydroxy group, also called an alcohol group, is on carbon number four. So you hear it, four hydroxy. And that's why it'll seem to have all these different names. It's the same thing. And the easiest thing to call it is just HNE, hydroxy non and all. Non is the prefix for nine, because it has nine carbons total. And this is the toxic aldehyde. Just like alcohol is metabolized to an aldehyde, acetaldehyde, um, fats, that undergo lipid peroxidation and cooking oils are metabolized to HNE. And that's going to be a very big deal for health. Okay, so what causes beta cell failure? The beta cells are the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. And as we spoke about, as they progressively fail, the diabetic type 2 person does worse and worse and has to go on insulin. They no longer can, you know, have themselves treated with just an oral medication. Okay, some is genetic, sometimes called the Barker hypothesis. Some persons are born with fewer beta cells. It could be epigenetic due to malnutrition of the mother. Um, beta cell death can also be due to saturated fat. 
Um, as saturated fat, we talk about it starts out in the muscle, goes down to the liver, then it starts accumulating in the pancreas, and the pancreas progressively loses its ability to produce insulin. And palmitate, the classic most common saturated fat, C16 with you know zero double bond, C16 zero right there, um, is thought to be directly toxic to pancreatic beta cells. Um, the paper by Heckerman is interesting, lipotoxic endoplasmic reticulum stress in pancreatic beta cells. So we'll go through what endoplasmic reticulum stress means in just a moment. Also, palmitate was shown to deplete calcium from endoplasmic reticulum. Normally, the endoplasmic reticulum sequesters calcium. So basically, anything that interferes with calcium is highly toxic to the human body. Okay. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm a believer there's no such thing as good fats. Dr. McDougall just made a video a couple days ago about fats, and he basically <laughs> said what I agree with, what Pritikin agrees with, and pretty much anybody who's closely studied it, you want to just eat a minimum amount of fat. Okay, anyways, um, next, so that's the palmitate saturated fat theory of beta cell dysfunction. They all, I think, contribute variable amounts. The genetic theory, we talked about that. And by the way, if a person eats low-fat vegan all their life, they'll never get diabetes. So that's the most powerful thing is their diet. Okay, Dr. Tetsumori Yamashima, and he has put forth what is called the toxic aldehyde theory. There's also a, a, another way to describe it, the calpane cathepsin theory, but we'll call it the toxic aldehyde theory from omega-6 cooking oils. And what that's all about is lipid peroxidation of PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and how they destroy heat shock protein number 70, called HSP70. Beta cell death due to toxic aldehydes, um, and 4 hydroxy is the most important, the most common one you're going to hear about. That's the important one, 4 hydroxy nonanol. Okay, so we're going to go into that in a lot more detail in just a moment. And I think that's a big part of what's happening, why uh, persons from India have such a high rate of diabetes. Um, the next thing is dedifferentiation. Okay, and, and this is sort of a really hot topic in type 2 diabetes research. And the thought is they're seeing that a lot of people seem to still have beta cells. They're just not functioning. And then there's all kinds of research and effort to try to restore function to those beta cells as a way to treat diabetes, maybe cure diabetes. Um, but here, here's my advice. You know, I've been around in medicine. I've been a doctor 30 years. And I can tell you 99.9% .9 of new drugs end up not working. There's some problem with them. And it usually takes 30 years to figure out what's the true indication, what's the true dose. So don't hold your breath. Okay, and here I got Roger's Law of Disease Curing. The more profitable it is to manage a disease, the less likely a cure will ever be discovered. You can guarantee that. Okay, diabetes is a billion-dollar disease. You think they want somebody to come along and cure it? <laughs> Are you crazy? No way. There will be problems in the clinical trials for whatever comes up with the improved beta cell function. Um, you know, so, you know, there's no grant money in diet, okay? Uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes of less than four years duration, what percent are cured with pills? Zero. Okay, you know, they, by definition, a chronic disease is not cured. It's just managed with a pill every day. What percent of patients with type 2 diabetes for four years or less are curable with a low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet? About 100%, okay? So the average person, the way their brain works is they think that their health is the responsibility of the doctor. They go to the doctor and they take a pill, all right? But, you know, a person who knows a little bit about health and a little bit more intelligent person recognizes, gee, if I look at the epidemiology, people who eat low-fat, plant-based diet, they don't have any diabetes. I'll do what they do. Maybe I'll improve my health. Yeah, that's a smart thing to do. Uh, what about people who are not curable with a diet? They probably have like type 1 or type late onset type 1 or type 1.5 diabetes. But there's tons and tons. Just go on the internet. You'll see tons and tons of people reverse their type 2 diabetes by going low-fat vegan. Okay. Now, a little bit about what happens with fat. So the initiating event with um, type 2 diabetes is accumulation of fat in the skeletal muscle. And that causes insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle, which eventually leads to postprandial after eating uh, hyperglycemia. Then fat accumulates in the liver, and that leads to insulin resistance in the liver. So the liver can't monitor blood glucose level effectively, and it keeps on running gluconeogenesis even when the blood sugar is normal, and that causes fasting hyperglycemia. But the big problem is as the liver sort of overfills with fat. So fatty liver is a big warning that you have a major problem, and you better get your act together, you're going to end up 
with much more serious disease. The next step is that fat starts accumulating in the pancreas. And by the way, I do believe that fat accumulation in the pancreas is toxic to the pancreas and causes the death of pancreatic cells. And the reason I say that is I've been looking at CAT scans for you know 30 years, and I can tell you it is routine in older diabetics. Their pancreas is largely replaced, like more than half replaced with fat. I've seen it three quarters replaced or more with fat. These type 2 diabetics got these small little pancreases surrounded by a lot of fat replacement, consistent with the loss of beta cells and probably other cells in their pancreas too. I know the alpha cells are more resistant, but pancreatic fatty atrophy is super common. Talk to any radiologist, you know, they'll all tell you the same thing. And then, of course, once the, once the pancreas goes and they get worsening and worsening hyperglycemia, they end up with tons of other complications. This is a terrible disease, and it's completely preventable. It's not normal aging, okay? Other populations that eat plant-based, they don't have any diabetes. Okay, this is just a quick reminder. We talked about this in Diabetes Part 5 lecture about the flip-flop maneuver whereby fatty acids and circulate in the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane lipid bilayer of skeletal muscle, then to the inner leaflet of the bilayer, and then get into the cytoplasm. We'll discuss that a lot more in that previous lecture, but I'm just giving you sort of a heads up. That's something you should know about diabetes. It's the most important thing you could know about it. Okay, um, and then in an earlier lecture where we talked about the unifying theory of diabetic complications, this was the paper written by Michael Brownlee, one of the most magnificent genius papers ever written on the subject of diabetes or in any field of medicine. Um, I, I was so fascinated when I studied all these uh, biochemistry papers on diabetes. I went and talked to a whole bunch of endocrinologists about it. None of them knew these papers. And on top of it, one of them invited me to lecture. And... Um, and then, you know, me being stupid and socially awkward, I kept talking about the biochemistry of diabetes, and then I could tell they were embarrassed that they didn't know any of the, the papers or any of this work. So then I got, they, didn't, they never followed up on their invitation for me to speak. That happens to me all the time. I hardly get invited to speak anywhere. People don't like people who tell the truth. <laughs> and they want everyone to say, oh, olive oil is good for you. Soy is good for you. <laughs> That's what people want to hear. That's a bunch of crap, okay? Uh, MSG is okay. That's all BS. You know, if you want to be healthy, you want to optimize everything. All right. So anyways, so what happens with uh, diabetes? Excessive fat undergoes beta oxidation, produces too many electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, that then overwhelm complex 1 and complex 2, which have to give their electrons to coenzyme Q. And then complex 3 in particular can't pump out its protons against the rising gradient within the intramembranous space between the outer mitochondrial membrane and this inner mitochondrial membrane. So electron transport reverses, and it drops an electron down onto oxygen within the mitochondrial matrix, which now, going backwards, produces superoxide anion and leading to reactive oxygen. So we're not going to talk about that now, but I'm just letting you know that's sort of the backdrop of what leads to diabetes complications. And I cover that extensively in another lecture. But this idea of electron transport being very important in diabetes and being inhibited and reversing in diabetes is a really key point. Okay, now we're going to get to hydroxynonanol. So here's the review paper where some of this was covered. Uh, for hydroxynonanol, lipid peroxidation product, a review. Um, and one of the things hydroxynonanol does is it inhibits ATP synthase, sometimes called complex 5 of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So these are all the electron transport complexes, complex 1, 2, 3, and 4. Coenzyme Q is located right here. Cytochrome C is right here. Very common uh, phospholipid in the inner mitochondrial membrane is the uh, cardiolipin right here with uh, twice as many phospholipid tails, 4 instead of 2. Okay, but Hydroxynonanol is a mitochondrial toxin, as is lead, as is cadmium, as is saturated fat, and to a lesser extent, other types of fat. All right, so anyways, that's an important point. And now we're going to get into a little more advanced stuff. I gave a previous lecture, that one about alcohol and oil and Asian dementia, okay, with regard to... Uh, Japan and China, especially in the work of Yamashima, Dr. Yamashima. Okay, so I color coded this to make it a little easier to follow. So hydroxynonanol binds to heat shock protein number 70. So here's heat shock protein. I'm going to go into this in more detail in a moment. I'll slow it down and simplify it, but it's good that you see the picture first when we talk about it. 
So here's heat shock protein number 70. Actually, the normal job of heat shock protein number 70 is to transport defective proteins into the lysosome where they can be recycled. A neuron, for example, does not turn over. It stays alive and intact you know, for the entire life of the person because it has to have your memories for your lifetime, right? So it has to recycle its proteins. They become glycated over time, dysfunctional, and they have to be recycled. And the, cat, the lysosome is full of powerful enzymes to recycle them. And heat shock protein, in addition to being a chaperone to transport defective proteins to the lysosome, heat shock protein also stabilizes the lysosome membrane by how it regulates other fatty acids that make up this membrane and keep it stable. It has to be a very powerful membrane not to be affected by all these enzymes of the lysosome. So what happens is when H&E binds to HSP, so when hydroxynonanol binds to the heat shock protein, the green heat shock protein, hydroxynonanol is the purple in this picture, what happens is that makes calpane, a powerful cytoplasm protease, be attracted to the heat shock protein, and it cuts it in half like a scissors. That's why it's drawn to look like a scissors. It cuts heat shock protein, and now it can no longer chaperone deliver these proteins to the lysosome. It can no longer help maintain the lysosome membranes intact. The lysosome lyses, releases cathepsin. Cathepsin is this powerful protease digestive enzyme. It just chews up the neuron and eats everything and kills it. Okay, so that is the sequence of events. And so you'll ask yourself, well, where does hydroxynonanol come from? It comes from cooking oils. That's why I say no cooking oils, not one drop because it's already in the oil, even if you don't cook with it, it's already been heated into it in the processing to make the oil. Then when you cook with it, you crank it up even farther. Plus, when you have lipid peroxidation in your own body, you also make hydroxynonanol. It's the main byproduct of lipid peroxidation. Okay, now we're going to talk real quick. This is another paper by Yamashima. So here's Yamashima, the Japanese neuroscientist, Tetsumori Yamashima. And here's one of his famous papers, hydroxynonanol causes Langerhans, that's the, the islet cells of the pancreas cell, degeneration in the pancreas, Japanese macaque monkeys. So what they did is they took these monkeys and they injected into them intravenously for 24 weeks in a row what would be the typical dietary amount of HNE persons are exposed to. And then when they examined their pancreas later on, they found out that it was destroying the pancreatic beta cells. So there was no change in the behavior of the monkeys. Um, this was an in vivo study. So this is not something in tissue culture. This is, was in real monkeys, living, active. The h &E also caused proliferation of peroxisomes, so that's a secondary mechanism of beta cell injury. We're going to focus on the calpane activation um, mechanism, just like we showed that image of a moment ago in the hippocampal neurons of the brain memory center, whereby the hydroxynonanol binds to HSP heat shock protein and it cleaves it and that causes lysosome disruption and cathepsin release to digest the cell and kill it. Okay, also why are they called heat shock proteins? Because their job is to manage proteostasis, keep the proteins normal in folding and normal in function. When you heat up a cell, you damage proteins. So then heat shock proteins are up regulated. You make more of them to try to fix the problem of protein misfolding and proteins being defective to try to save the cell. If the heat shock proteins cannot save the cell, the cell is going to die. Okay? Um, there's some additional mechanisms we'll talk about in a moment as well, but that's a big thing for heat shock proteins to do. Um, and the other thing that was noticed was the primate cells had very poor ability to defend against hydroxynonanol. Carbonylation just means you know, it can form a carbonyl group on the heat shock protein. It's binding. Um, these were previously healthy animals, okay? None of them had a deficiency in acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, that enzyme that causes Asian flushing syndrome for persons who can't drink any alcohol. That's my point. You don't need to have that enzyme problem to have problems from hydroxynonanol. It's bad, okay? And primates, and likely us, can't defend against these things that well, so hydroxynonanol is a very highly toxic substance. And why is it that we don't have a good inborn body system to defend against it because we're not supposed to be eating oils. They're a bizarre processed food. Okay. Um, so here's some references. Inhibition of hydroxynonanol um, of circa. So circa is sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum. Really, sarcoplasm is what it's called in the muscle, but endoplasmic reticulum in other cells, calcium ATPase. 
and low concentrations of H&E, low concentrations, will open up protein-mediated links in the membrane. So what's the point? Your endoplasmic reticulum, in addition to making secretory proteins like insulin, it also manages calcium. It's a reservoir of calcium storage for controlling the processes in the cell that are regulated by calcium. Calcium activates a lot of things, okay? Calcium is related to insulin release. Calcium is related to muscle contraction in arterial lining cells. It's related to releasing neurotransmitter in the brain. So anything that interferes with calcium metabolism is a big deal and it's very bad for you, okay? Uh, so here's Yamashima's paper. Hydroxynonanol causes Langerhan cell degeneration in pancreas. Okay. Okay, now here I was waiting for this slide. So here's HSP heat shock protein number 70. Its purpose is recycling dysfunctional proteins. They call that a chaperone, the way we showed it carrying the defective proteins to the lysosome. Um, it's called heat shock because it's upregulated when it's heated. Hydroxynonanol is a toxic aldehyde. That's a key phrase to know, toxic aldehyde. Just like acetaldehyde is a toxic aldehyde of alcohol metabolism, hydroxynonanol is a toxic aldehyde of cooking oils and of lipid peroxidation. Uh, lipid peroxidation is a chain reaction that occurs in PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these omega-6 cooking oils will contain H&E, plus you produce more when it's heated, and additional H&E is just made in our bodies whenever there's lipid peroxidation. Um, so some other phrases. We talked about the secretory proteins like insulin that are secreted from the cell, are made in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then there's ways that the cell tries to handle misfolded proteins. There's something called the ERAD, endoplasmic reticulum activated degradation, meaning that misfolded proteins, they actually are ubiquinated, meaning covered with these ubiquitin uh, molecules that sort of are like markers to say this protein needs to be uh, degraded in the proteasome. The proteasome is like a wood chipper for proteins and it, and it chops them up. All this stuff about protein misfolding and recycling proteins, it's worth knowing about because later on what I'm sort of building up towards is um, insights on neurodegeneration. Why do people become demented? And this whole mechanism is very important, major contributor to dementia and cognitive decline. And there's a good news here. This is not just, you know, sad stuff. It's easy. Don't eat oils. Minimize your fat intake. You don't have to have any of these problems. But I can tell you, the average person, tons of people are diabetic. And even if they're not diabetic, they've got these high fat, sad diet, tons of problems, okay? And they cause them themselves. All right, autophagy is the other mechanism of handling misfolded proteins and defective proteins, which is like we just talked about. HSP70, chaperoning the defective proteins to the lysosome, and then the lysosome breaking them down into their constituent amino acids. When a cell has too many misfolded and defective proteins, that's called endoplasmic reticulum stress, and then the cell responds by unfolded protein response called UPR to try to you know, upregulate other components of the protein folding apparatus, like more chaperone proteins, for example. So the cell's trying to save itself. If it can't adequately make um, the proteins it needs to secrete, it'll often die, go into apoptosis, program cell death, or it could potentially de-differentiate. So to de-differentiate might mean to just retrograde, become, you know, non-functional, but it also can mean become cancer, okay? Okay, so what's the good news? What can you do? Well, first of all, you need to know no oil, not one drop. And the reason why I like McDougall and Esselstyn so much and, you know, Campbell, they'll tell you no oil. That means not one drop. Don't eat this stuff. Because once a person says, I'll only have a little bit, they end up on a slippery slope and they just go downhill. It's very difficult to have a little bit of oil, just to have a little bit of meat. No, you start eating way more and you realize you get all sick. I can tell you the average ignorant person I talk to I'm like, you might want to improve their diet. They all say, and this is a, these are people who have, you know, had a myocardial infarction. They are diabetic. They're overweight. They're partially demented. They all tell me, oh, I eat well. Everybody thinks they eat well. I think that's a Dunning-Kruger effect. They, everybody thinks they eat well. I have a lot of chicken, a lot of fish, a lot of egg whites, olive oil. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, and, I, you know, all this disease, it's not because of the diet. It's because of my family. It must be genetic. We're all sick. Yeah, it's because you all eat the same thing genetically stupid. 
Okay, um, Walter Kempner, Nathan Pritikin, McDougal, Bernard, lots of doctors. Any doctor who's worked with it has seen reversal of type 2 diabetes when a person goes low-fat vegan. It's shown quite readily with bariatric surgery, with the diets related to bariatric surgery to get the patients ready. Um, exercise is a wonderful thing. Exercise basically has the same effect on skeletal muscle as does insulin. It gets more glucose type 4 uh, glucose transporters to translocate from the cytoplasm to the plasma cell membrane so they can bring glucose into the cell. The interesting thing about exercise is it uses a totally different mechanism than does insulin. So what that means is even if you've got insulin resistance, you can get great uptake of glucose from exercise. So all diabetics should walk more and exercise more. Uh, fruits and vegetables are wonderful. They give you lots of antioxidants. The antioxidants help the cell to handle some of these effects. They're still not great at it, but it makes it better than it otherwise would be. And we talked about this before. If it's a hot 100 degree day, an animal outside in the sun goes, walks into the shade. Plant can't walk in the shade. It needs chemicals, antioxidants to protect itself from the excessive uh, sun and ultraviolet ray, you know, rays. Um, that's why suns have all the antioxidants. You don't get it from eating meat. The animals use it up. Okay, lots of starches are real good for you. I recommend only eat organic. There's terrible herbicides in non-organic food like a uh, glyphosate, atrazine, that stuff's bad for you. Uh, Roy Taylor wrote a good book. He's the guy who wrote this book. Where is it? I think I got it over here somewhere. Something about uh, life without diabetes. It came out recently, 2020. He's one of these guys. He won the Banting Award one time. He's real smart. Uh, basically, what he noticed was he worked with Jerry Shulman with the nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy that showed skeletal muscle accumulation of fat was the first detectable sign of insulin resistance. Um, and he found just... For one week, you fast the person, you'll, you can decrease their liver fat. He showed that with MRI. And as soon as you get the fat decrease in the liver, it'll decrease in the pancreas. And patients will often improve their uh, function if they still got some cells in there, like if they're de-differentiated, just not functional, versus if they're, if they're dead, you can't bring them back. So here's some of the references. Um, so that's there's nice reviews, and here's showing how hydroxynanol is so toxic, it's not even funny. It inhibits the connection between glycolysis and lactate. So it screws up anaerobic metabolism. It inhibits Krebs cycle, the enzyme aconitase. So it screws up Krebs cycle. That's a major central pathway of oxidative metabolism. That means with oxygen. It then, we talked about it a moment ago, it um, inhibits the ATP synthase on the inner mitochondrial membrane. So it screws up oxidative phosphorylation. That's the main way you make ATP. It's basically screwing up everything. You know, that's why you should never eat oils, never. Um, and then people say, oh, well, olive oil is good. Yeah, right. Olive oil is not just pure monounsaturated fatty acid. It also contains a significant amount of saturated fat and a significant amount of PUFA. I recommend never eat that stuff either. Um, Protein, protein targets for carbonylation and rat liver mitochondria. Yes, it's a mitochondrial toxin. We talked about that. Uh, here's another paper about how it damages pancreatic islet cells. Um, it's not just Yamashima's idea. This is well known that uh, it's a problem for pancreatic beta cells. And then we talked about some of these papers, the Montigny paper on calcium uh, metabolism being damaged by uh, hydroxynanol. Uh, here's another paper on lipotoxic endoplasmic reticulum stress in pancreatic beta cells. And that one was, was with about palmitate, how it also damages calcium metabolism. So both hydroxynanol and palmitate damage calcium metabolism in pancreatic beta cells. That's a disaster, okay? That's a big deal, and that's really bad. That's another reason why you want to minimize your intake. That's why I say no meat, not one bite. If you study it, you'll come to that conclusion. Um, and chicken and fish are just as bad or worse. Don't eat that stuff. Okay, calpane-mediated HSP cleavage and hippocampal cells. There's a famous Yamashima paper about how it causes dementia. It's your memory center hippocampus. Um, here's uh, Yamashima's paper on how it uh, disrupts the pancreatic beta cells. Okay, the Roy Taylor uh, diabetes book, Life Without Diabetes. So anyways, I hope that was helpful. And the key points were omega-3 cooking oils are very toxic substances. In earlier lectures, I've talked about how they damage the brain. Um, they make you stupid, they cause dysfunction in your hippocampus, and they also destroy beta cells in your pancreas, and I think that this is a good chance, this is one of the major reasons why uh, South Asian Indian persons have increased incidence of diabetes, so I recommend they eat less fried food, 
and think they'll do well with that.